and a whole series of embarrassingly bad presenters in a wobbly studio with shaky cameras and they churn out right-wing propaganda. The people who in the past would have been cautious about what they say, they've been emboldened by a lot of this stuff. They don't like the progress that we've made. They don't like a tolerant society. They want a, an angry white society, a, a gammon mm -hmm. uh, society. Hello John, how Hello. are you? I'm fine. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Thank very you for, busy day. <laughs> thank you for coming to the Joe offices. It's a pleasure. I'm very jealous of, of your offices. I wish my office was like this. It's, well, it's very East London, isn't it? Well, you've got daylight, which is, which is quite well, nice. There, there is that. There is that. You don't yeah. get a lot of that in London, I have to say. Hogwarts is not a good place for, for daylight. <laughs> um, you've just come from Politics Live. I have, yes. And it was straight after Boris Johnson's evidence. Yes. Uh, which he will present to the Privileges Committee tomorrow. Yes. Has been published. Yes. It? Do you have any first thoughts? Uh, yes, I do. I was astonished to find myself on the um, on, on the on the couch on the on the Politics Live um, desk with a Tory MP who's still trying to defend Boris Johnson. I always remember um, another Tory MP uh, contacted me during the leadership election for Boris Johnson, and he said, "I just want to tell you why I'm voting." for Boris Johnson. I said, I'm, I'm not your priest, you don't have to confess to me. And he said, I know it's all going to end in tears, it'll either be a sex scandal, or a financial scandal, or a lying scandal, or a combination of all three. But he'll win the election for us, and then we'll worry about him after that. And I often think about him and remind him that he said this. Everybody knew how Boris Johnson would end up. He spent his whole life lying, lying and lying and lying again. And I remember when he stood up in Parliament and said that he hadn't broken the rules. I remember thinking, you're lying. Of course you're lying. We all know that you broke the rules. Um, and now he's trying to say that it really wasn't his fault. It was his advisor's fault. I mean, come on. Mm. He's the man who wrote the rules, supposedly. He certainly put his name to the rules. The whole country was meant to obey the rules that he imposed upon the country, and yet he didn't seem to think that he had to obey the rules. And it's the smirking that gets me and the arrogance and the sense that we're all the little people. We have to follow the rules, but he doesn't. Mm. Did he know what he was doing? Of course he did. He stood up in one of the, the rooms and said, this is the least socially distanced room in the whole country. Of course he knew what he was doing. And MPs have now got an opportunity to give him his comeuppance, and I hope they do. But do you think that's the problem? So a little bit of context to the Boris Johnson is a perpetual liar claim. I mean, just two examples. His first job at the Times newspaper, he was sacked for making up a quote that yes. he put into an article. Another example, he once stood infamously on his steps and declared he wasn't having an affair with his spectator colleague, uh, Petronella Wyatt, and he was. Do you think that maybe the public or voters don't care that he's a liar? Now, that's an interesting question. Have we got to the stage now where post-truth politics has taken over? He's got lots of things in common with Trump, but one of the things that they both have in common is they both think if they just spew lies across the public arena, eventually we'll all stop noticing, and even worse, will begin to think, well, all politicians are the same. They're all the same, they all lie, and I can't believe anything that I ever read because, because everything I ever read is a lie. I don't want us ever to get to that stage, and I really fear we're getting to that stage, apart from anything else. Today we were talking about disinformation at the Commons Culture Select Committee. We really need the public to be able to believe politicians at times of crisis. COVID being a prime example. Huge sections of the community didn't sign up for the vaccine because they weren't believing the public service messaging that they were getting. And we've got to live in a country where setting aside political arguments, experts are able to go on screen and on the airwaves and online and tell people things that will save their lives. Mm. Uh, and the problem with Boris Johnson is because he has so abused his office and so abused his role um, as a politician and then cabinet minister and then prime minister 
that I, I fear that he has um, spread this concept of post-truth politics, as it's called in the States, and it just makes the public question all of us. Mm, but then there's, I suppose there's two different types of lying that politicians can do. And there is lying on the airwaves or lying during an election campaign. And that sort of is, you know, frowned upon. It's not great for the narrative, but you can kind of get away with it. What Boris Johnson is being charged with is misleading the House. So that's lying in Parliament. And that's the most egregious form of lying, I suppose, you can do. I mean, what, how do you think we've got to a point where a politician... Do you think that like, Tony Blair or Theresa May would have ever lied to the House knowingly? Well, I've got to be careful here because obviously the rules of libel uh, apply. Yes. So I have to choose my words carefully. Um, I don't think we proceeded to the Iraqi war on the basis of a, a series of truthful statements mm. uh, by our political leaders at the time. I always remember Robin Cook, I interviewed Robin Cook on my LBC show um, at the time. He just resigned and I said, it was before the bombing started, and I said to him, um, did you get, as Foreign Secretary, to read everything that Tony Blair got to see? Because remember, Blair kept saying, if you could see what I see, you would uh, understand uh, why we must topple Saddam. And he said, yes, I get to see everything. And I said, does Saddam have chemical weapons, Robin Cook? And he said, no. Does he have the capacity to strike Cyprus, for example, with missiles? And he said, absolutely not. So the Labour MPs who to this day claim that if only they'd known what they now know, they would never have voted for the war, they're kidding themselves. They knew, I as a journalist, was able to call upon the country's foremost experts on chemical weapons and long-range missiles. Um, and it was clear that Saddam did not have what Blair pretended that he had as a pretext for war. So we've had a long history of premiers not telling the truth. So Boris not, Johnson's not unique in that, but I think he has scaled new heights of dishonesty. My assumption is Boris Johnson is lying unless there's a conclusive proof that he's telling the truth. I think his default position is to lie. Mm. But do you think then the British public have been conditioned to accept politicians lying then? That's my worry. It's really concerning. It is. And it's very concerning in light of another uh, incident you're going through at the moment, which is you have charged GP News with a breach of Ofcom. Yeah. Do you want to tell us a bit about that? Yes, yeah, so Ofcom is the regulator that determines um, what broadcasters can do. It's de it's, it determines what the BBC can do, for example. And we've seen the spread, I'm afraid, of Propaganda, propaganda on news channels. And GB News, which the vast majority of your viewers won't ever have seen, is this nasty little right-wing uh, channel. Andrew Neil set it up, and then he was so embarrassed by what he'd done that he had to, he had to leave. And it's got a whole series of you know, embarrassingly bad presenters um, in a wobbly studio with shaky cameras. And they churn out right-wing propaganda. Now, Ofcom rules are very clear. You cannot, on a news programme, uh, use politicians, obviously, because news programmes are meant to be about objectivity. But we have Jacob Rees-Mogg presenting on, on GP News and a whole variety of, 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 of others um, from the Conservative Party. But one thing struck me as particularly bad it's um, Esther McVeigh, who's a Tory MP, former uh, TV presenter, and her husband, uh, Philip. And they interviewed the Chancellor of the Exchequer about the budget, which the Treasury then promoted on social media. So here we have two Tory MPs interviewing a Tory Chancellor about a Tory budget and all of that being promoted by the Treasury. A mm. clear breach of... Ofcom's rules. And I uh, grilled the high heat and the boss, the big boss of Ofcom at the select committee when she made one of her occasional appearances, Dame Melanie Dawes. And she just looked a bit confused. I got the sense she'd probably never watched this programme. She didn't seem to have done much preparation mm. uh, for the select <laughs> committee hearing at all. Um, 
which is kind of funny because she's paid hundreds of thousands of pounds a year to run off com and, and kind of prepare. And going before Parliament is quite a big deal. You should do some homework. Anyway, I tweeted the exchange with her looking a bit like it. Um, and it's now on, I think, about 2.8 or 9 million views. Mm. So it's clearly something that people care about. Now, Ofcom's a very unhappy place. And as a former journalist and as a politician, I always promise people that if they write to me as whistleblowers, send me uh, direct messages, DMs on social media, I will keep their identity secret. And I get lots of people uh, as whistleblowers from the BBC writing to me, um, who are very unhappy about the Director General and Gary Lineker and the, the fact that uh, the, 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 the chair of the BBC is a Tory donor who facilitated a loan for Boris Johnson, who then gave him a job. Obviously, that upsets journalists of the BBC. A lot have written to me privately about it. And at Ofcom, a lot of people have written to me. Now, there have been numerous complaints about these two Tory MPs doing the interview um, on a news channel, breaching Ofcom's rules. But my spies at Ofcom tell me that they've already decided to um, say this is OK. And they're writing a report at, a mo at the moment, which is then going to be given to their press office and they will release it. Let's just dial back a little tiny bit. So, I mean, a lot of politicians appear on news channels. As I guests. mean, Well, no, David Lammy hosts a programme on LBC. Richard Tice hosts a programme on Talk TV. Nigel Farage was with LBC for years. I mean, the, the list goes on. The problem here is that a Tory, a sitting Tory MP was interviewing the sitting Tory Chancellor. Is that what the, the, the issue is in your eyes in Ofcom guidance? Yes, I... Obviously, I, I think journalists should be presenting t TV news programmes because mm. they're trained. They ask the relevant questions. They'll challenge uh, politicians regardless of party. We don't really want to go down the kind of Fox I News I think a route. lot of people would be shouting then saying, I don't agree with that. Will they? Why? Because would you argue that perhaps there are some journalists who in hopes of getting, of securing the next big interview or securing the next big scoop, maybe they're in the pocket of big government or they might be, you know, more to one side, they might be more favourable to the SNP or to Labour. I've yet to meet many journalists who are favourable to the SNP, but setting that aside... Welcome uh, to Joe. <laughs> set, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> setting um, that aside uh, for, uh, for one moment, a, journalism is a noble profession. Of course, there are bad journalists. Uh, there are too often polemicists who just rant and offer opinion um, in newspapers rather than uh, challenging and questioning. But TV news has always been different from the Daily Mail, where it's difficult to tell what is opinion and what is news, for example. On TV news, the rules have always been pretty clear, that the person who's communicating with you is aiming at objectivity. Uh, Andrew Neil, for example, who we all know was very right-wing chairman of the Spectator, pro-Brexit, anti-Scottish independence. But when he was on the BBC, you'd be hard-pressed, I think, to say that he was biased against uh, one political party or the other. He was, he was a thug, but he was an equal opportunities thug. In fact, Boris Johnson was so scared of him that he wouldn't appear at the last election he did, to, he be chaired him, didn't he? To, to, be, to be interviewed by him. So, um, of course, there are journalists with political opinions. But what we're seeing on, on GP News is something different. Sitting Tory MPs interviewing another sitting Tory MP um, on a news programme on a news channel. That strays into territory that we haven't seen before. It's Fox News style propaganda. And more importantly, it breaches clearly Ofcom's rules, which is why I challenged uh, Dame Melanie Dawes about it. Um, we, don't, we don't want Fox News uh, here in the UK. We want journalism here in the UK. And I, I thoroughly dislike what's happening at GB News and also talk TV to, to some extent as well. I don't know if you saw the interview between the, the former uh, culture secretary, Nadine Doris and Boris Johnson. Did you see mm -hmm. it? It was his absolutely hysterical um, loving. Um, but no stretch of the imagination 
is that journalism and uh, Ofcom should be coming down hard against it. I mean, how do you, how do you rationalise that with some of the sources that were coming out of the BBC over the past couple of weeks that said during the pandemic, people at the top of BBC were getting direct calls from Number 10 and telling them what to put on their news site. I mean, how is that different? Well, because um, <coughs> if the BBC bosses are up to it, um, they should be telling the people calling them where to go. Mm. Uh, I've been in this position as a journalist. I remember when I presented BBC Breakfast, um, we had Labour press officers who'd managed to get the direct uh, line in the gallery who would phone up and complain to the editor as I was on air um, about the interview that I was doing and try to intimidate the editor into instructing me to become softer uh, in my interviewing, in my earpiece. Those were Labour spin doctors. Mm -hmm. And I always remember just how different the culture was when I went to IT, because I never really felt the BBC bosses had my back when I was doing those kind of interviews, because um, I was quite a tough interviewer, and I, I just never felt that they were proud, you know, when I came off air and I'd done a tough interview at the BBC. By contrast, I remember going to ITV, and I was interviewing, a, a, I think at that stage, a Tory minister, and uh, the Tory press office was on the phone to my editor. Um, we were meant to be going to a commercial uh, break and then we were meant to be moving on to a different item. And I heard the editor in my ear say, um, Tory press office complaining about your interview. Um, so you know what, F them, uh, let's run this and continue beyond the, the, new, uh, the commercial break. And I thought, come to somewhere that's a bit more ballsy, I think I'm going to enjoy it here. Yeah. In my last job as well as a producer, I would get calls from number 10. It, it's really not uncommon, is it, to no. get calls in the gallery from the government, you know, arguing they don't like your point and can you, can you swear it? But it's your job to say no. Absolutely. And I was always proud that people didn't know what my politics uh, was when I was a, 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 pr a presenter and a political correspondent. In fact, Alex Salmond, uh, former leader of the SNP, you might have heard of him. Uh, Alex Salmond, uh, I'd interviewed him lots of times, I'd had dinner with him uh, as a journalist, and he was really surprised when I ran as an SNP candidate in 2015 and told people he'd always assumed I was Labour. Oh, really? I was quite pleased I'd managed did to... did very well there. I'm quite pleased I managed to go through a few dinners with him, with him having no idea what my politics mm. were. So on to GB News. What, what do you think the end game or the end goal with their, with their editing is? I mean, what's the point of it? What are they after? I think that is the key question. What is the point of Ofcom? As far as I can see, there is no particular point of Ofcom at the moment. Um, they don't seem well run. Uh, the staff appear to be uh, miserable. The staff are uh, messaging me in private um, they are flip-flopping about all sorts of issues, for example, on trans rights, where uh, Melanie Dawes originally was very supportive of, uh, of trans uh, rights, and uh, I told her that I thought it was inappropriate for the BBC repeatedly to platform this very sinister group called the LGB Alliance, which is an anti-trans group. So when you do an item about trans issues, you then get the LGB Alliance popping up for for apparent balance, mm -hmm. something you'd never do if you did an item on Black Lives Matter, for example. I put this point to her select committee. She agreed with me about my point, um, but within weeks, she had held meetings with the LGB Alliance and flipped on the issue. I mean, you need stronger leadership than that. What, what is that? I mean, is that part of the culture war? What, what is? Yes, I think all of this is part of the culture war. Um, the, 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 the vice chair of the Conservative Party has said quite explicitly that he thinks the next election will be uh, won or lost on culture wars mm -hmm. and trans rights as an issue. Being, he said that word for word quite openly. So the other day there was a Tory MP stood up in the House of Commons and she talked about sex education in schools. And she said people were being told at schools that there were 71 different genders and that they were being taught in school about how to strangle 
their partners uh, during sex. Yeah. So I sat down last night, because uh, I knew I was be, I'd be asked about this today in Politics Live. So I sat down and I read her 51 page report. Grim reading it, it made, I have to say. But she was unable to substantiate either of those claims. They're both clearly untrue. I think the 71 genders was a misreporting of something in the Isle of Man, which is out with our jurisdiction. The strangling thing, she just seems to have made that up. But um, she said that in the House of Commons, at Prime Minister's questions, and the Prime Minister responded by saying that he would uh, have an inquiry into how you teach sex in schools. I mean, leaving aside how much an inquiry would possibly cost and just how ridiculous that is. I mean, where do you think this is all coming from? This America, it's the right-wing culture wars in the States. And in her report, 51-page a report that she's written, she's an evangelical Christian, incidentally. Um, and in the 51-page report, you know, trans people were mentioned repeatedly um, in the report. And it's very clear what all this is about. In America, they decided that gay people and uh, gay equality was too firmly entrenched really to try and unpick it. Gay marriage seemed too, uh, too established. But they thought, the right-wing culture warriors, that trans people were just a little bit vulnerable, mm -hmm. uh, a little bit marginalised. And so it's trans people that they've been attacking repeatedly. Um, and my great fear, quite apart from the cruelty of the way that trans people are now abused routinely, uh, BBC programmes, uh, in the pages of the tabloids and elsewhere. My real fear uh, is after they've dealt with trans people, they'll start coming for the rest of us. Gay people uh, high up there on the list of people that they will come for. Because this Tory MP, one of uh, the concerns in her 51-page report um, appeared to be not just the fact that some children were identifying as trans, um, but there was stuff about uh, gay relationships and gay sex education. And she was harking back to the 1970s. Mm. Well, I went to school in the 1970s. I know you're going to say, John, I don't believe that, you're far too young. But no, I went to school in the 1970s. And when I did sex education in school, there was nothing for me. There was no sex education for gay people. There was nothing about relationships and love. There was nothing for heterosexuals about respect, uh, well, loving relationships. I went relationships. to a Catholic school, so there definitely wouldn't have been anything about respect or any sex education. Well, I, and I think what I think what and some I turned out a nightmare, so I don't really know <laughs> how that. I think what some of these grim culture warriors want is to wheel us back to the 1950s with all the social misery that that era had. And that's something that GB News really taps into. If you turn on their, pro I mean, I'm sure you're watching it all the time, but for those who aren't. Religiously, if that's um, the right turn of phrase. When you turn it on, I mean, Darren Grimes now doesn't have a program on there, but he used to, and this was a topic he was really concerned with. Calvin Robinson, who um, wears a dog collar, um, is very concerned with this as well. I mean, w w why do you think, you think this is all part of the culture war? You think that they're really getting into it well, GB News aren't planning to win an election, so why are they getting involved in it? Well, uh, there, 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 is a, uh, there is an audience in this country who are, who are hostile to progress, who don't like the fact that uh, lesbian and gay people have equality. They don't like the fact that people have children out with marriage. They don't like the progress that we've made. They don't like a tolerant society. They want a, an angry, white society, uh, a gammon mm -hmm. uh, society, and we, we, we know what they want. You see it on BBC Question Time quite often, don't you? The, the people who in the past would have been cautious about what they say, they've been emboldened by a lot of this stuff. And I see that often with, uh, with trans people, people who wouldn't previously have voiced some of their naked prejudices. Now feel that they can, now feel that they can do so. Um, I mean, it's hard to believe. Only a couple of years ago, it was Theresa May of all people, hardly a social radical, but she was championing uh, trans rights and saying that she was determined to ban conversion mm -hmm. therapy because she thought it was so cruel. That's where they try and pretend that you can convert trans people from being um, 
trans, uh, into being non-trans. It's obviously nonsense. And uh, she said that she thought it was very cruel. I know Boris Johnson uh, said that he didn't want to see conversion therapy banned. We're slipping backwards. Do you imagine that Ofcom would do anything about this rising concern that you have about representation for trans people on television? I don't see any signs of it. I listen to the Today programme and they seem quite obsessed by trans people. Uh, women are beyond obsessed with trans people. Um, I, I see it I just see it repeatedly. I've seen BBC articles online which are naked prejudice about trans people. Um, and of course in Scotland, as you know, the gender recognition uh, reform caused a huge amount of controversy. Not because ordinary people care about it. I've only had one person ever mention the trans issue on the doorstep as a parliamentarian going around the doors meeting my constituents. I've had nobody ever mention it at surgeries. And yet if you look at Twitter or look at the tabloids... Or if you look at your leadership contenders... Indeed, you'd think it's all that anybody's talking about. And it's, it, it's not. I think most people... I think most people, I hope most people, just want us all to be kind. I, 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 you know, I think most people, I hope most people, think, you know, if you feel you're born in the wrong body, then, you know, you should have the opportunity to correct what um, you think is a mistake. Isn't that just the kind way to respond to people who are unhappy? Mm. Thank you, John.